Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for becoming a better student, but a terrible resource for learning how to become a virtuoso musician. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, it looks like I just ruined the episode. Well, stop right off this. the bat. Yep, stop Oops. that. <laughs> My name is Thomas Frank, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Martin Bamey, who is uh, a better musician than I am. And today, we are going to attempt, at least, to talk about how the two of us have learned to play uh, instruments over the years. And as we alluded in the intro, neither of us, I mean, I don't think you would say that you are an expert musician of any kind. No, but even if I was, I wouldn't say it anyway, That's so true. it's hard to tell, but I'm fairly certain I'm not. Do you think that, like, Steve Vai or, I'm trying to think of another virtuoso guitarist, do you think any of those people even, would say that they're I experts? I don't even know who that is. Uh, I don't know. Who, uh, Eric Clapton, maybe? Do you know who that is? I know the name. Do you know Stevie Ray Vaughan? I know the name. Please say yes. Please say I know the name. I have no idea who that is, though. To Pride and Joy? What? Come on. I grew up on Tupac. I don't know who you're talking about. (laughs) That's true. That's true. You did grow up on music that doesn't tend to do a whole lot of uh, virtuosic, is that the word? Virtuosic performances. I I mean, well, I guess not not with traditional instruments, at least. You could make an argument that the stuff they did with synthesizers and, and sample machines could be pretty virtuosic, but... They weren't doing classical Bach piano compositions and then rapping over it. Not yet. Not yet, anyway. Actually, you know, I bet you somebody's done that before. Anyway, so that's what we're going to do with this episode. We're going to talk about uh, our our respective developments in playing music. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, at least, you probably know that I have been putting more and more time into guitar, but also piano and also vocal lessons. I've just kind of gone all in with all kinds of stuff. It's kind of my interest right now. And uh, you've been playing a lot of piano recently, though you don't tend to post anything public about it, right? The only, I don't really post my opinions or anything on Twitter. I just respond to people about stupid things That's like true. Granny Cream's Hot Butter Ice Cream. What a good song. It's a great song. The pinnacle of music. Uh, for the masses. <laughs> Whoever wrote that is a virtuoso by far. I was angry at Quentin because I thought I put a song from Greece or Gris or whatever, uh, the soundtrack from that on Twitter because I love it. And uh, it's on my study playlist. And he responded with that song. It's pretty similar. And I thought it was going to be a great addition to my study playlist, but I was wrong. You weren't wrong. It's <laughs> it's not going it's on the It's a great playlist. addition. It's not going on the playlist. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes. So people can see exactly why it should not go. Yeah, so I don't really share things. I share photos on Instagram. And once I shared a photo of a piano, and you could swipe over and see me learning a song from Final Fantasy X. Oh. But everything there, first and foremost, is for photography. So if I take more photos of pianos or something that related to a song I can play, I'll stick it on there. But it's not my purpose. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I guess we'll just have to take Martin's word that he plays the piano. <laughs> uh, no, actually, you were kind enough to let me film a little bit yes, of you uh... playing. So I think right about now, actually, we'll just we're just gonna put in like a few seconds of you playing piano, and then um, something that I did on the guitar, which is actually on Spotify. So cut here, Anna. So that might give you a little bit of an impression of where our skill levels are at. I definitely do not feel like an expert. I don't think you feel like an expert. I'm mildly competent at things. Mildly competent, yes. It's my specialty. But we've been learning, and a lot of people keep asking me on Instagram whenever I post guitar stuff, like, how am I learning? What resources am I using? I think one of the most common questions that I get is, what app are you using to learn guitar? What app are you using to learn piano? So maybe we can answer those questions Uh, in this episode. Before we get into all the details, and I don't even know what details there are because I don't have an outline for this episode, 
though I do have some some general learning materials I'm going to go through. I have one announcement. We have mugs. And oh, the, the audio. Look at me wearing the same shirt as oh, that mug. Oh, check it out. Oh, this for is, people on the video this is feed, called they might be able shilling. to see it. This is, buy this. <laughs> this is called shilling. <laughs> yes, I mean technically it is technically shilling. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> but yeah, we had that never stop learning shirt, which I love. And uh, not only did we get tank tops and also ladies cut t-shirts in stock of that, we also have mugs. So if you want to get your hands on a mug or you want to get a t-shirt at this point, uh, you can go over to collegeinfogeek.com slash merch and order whatever you want. Um, shilling over. That's yeah, about it. Whoops. I didn't yeah. mean to wear this. I didn't know he was going to talk about the mug. This is a coincidence. Look, but it's like, it's comfy. You know, it's just, it's, it's one of the most comfortable shirts I've ever worn. It's quite the comfortable. The fit is great. It's I've, certainly. I felt good about myself all day and it's inspired me to never stop learning. I don't know about. <laughs> yeah. It's like almost, it's like on the verge <laughs> of genuine, but there's like a hint of sarcasm underneath yeah, it. I'm going to, I'm going to master some sort of weird, sarcastic advertising strategy. You need, to, you need to practice your shilling. I mean, hey, it works for Hannibal <laughs> Burris, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, there it is. <laughs> But hey, uh, a good business person has to actually advertise the things that True. he makes. It is a comfy shirt. Yeah. I'll give it that. It is It is certainly a graphic printed on a standard next level tri-blend dark gray t-shirt that almost all of my t-shirts are. That's Including this one. I think this is literally the exact same t-shirt. Just because all of your graphic. t-shirts are comfy does not mean that this is not a comfy t-shirt. It's true. It just means that you have a good collection of comfy t-shirts. Yeah. I am a stickler for t-shirt quality. I think one of my... I don't know if this is my biggest pet peeve, but it is a pet peeve of mine when a company gives me a free t-shirt and maybe I like the company, but they've printed it on like the, I don't know, Walmart quality, mm. tarp cut, terrible quality t-shirt. I'm like, I'm just, I'm not going to want to wear it if you want me to advertise your company. But I guess in our case, we're not even advertising the company because it doesn't there's even say nothing the about College there. and Book Geek on there. It doesn't say yeah. hashtag follow me on Insta Twitter, but it does not. You know, if you want me, if you want someone to wear what you have created, it should be comfortable. So that was a big thing for me. Anyway, uh, let's just start this out with a question. Martin, what instruments do you play and how long have you been playing them? Um, I play piano primarily. I did play a lot of guitar before. I haven't in a, in a while after messing with my nerves and neck. It's not comfortable to play guitar right now. And I'm yeah. pretty sure that I would be jamming the screws that go through part of my bone into the strings mm. on the fretboard right now. And my finger needs to not do that. I do not like that mentally. For the time being. Yeah. Uh, I just, I don't know. I haven't been in guitar for a bit, but I did play it a lot. I, I took violin lessons when I was younger. I've Wait, made really? I've made beats. Yeah, yeah. I, took, I know you've I made took violin, beats. I've made beats. I've played bass guitar, and I have a shakuhachi that I can sometimes get notes to come out of. And you then want to explain what a shakuhachi is? It's a Japanese bamboo flute. Okay, it's pretty cool. It is like the ultimate meditation. Yes, object. I played it before meditation generally, <laughs> but I'm not really good at woodwind stuff because that's the first time I've ever messed with it. So like some days I could play it, and then the next day I'd come back and I'd be like, I can't find the angle. I don't have any idea how to make sounds come out of this. So you literally today. can't get a note to come out of it easily. Yeah, it's like it's not like you know with a piano anybody could make a note come out that's of it. True. You just hit something, but you have to like form part of the thing with your mouth oh it's like a clarinet where you need yeah, to develop your, those your, muscles your mouth needs to do the correct thing yeah same with like, i'm not very good at it but i have stuff. made sounds come out of it but i think that's probably all that i've played okay but i i mean i dabble in lots of stuff anything else that i happen to have touched probably wasn't that important the biggest things were piano guitar and making beats which is very different fruity loops Yes, I did. I did make most of them okay. in Fruity Loops. So I'm going to focus on piano for you since that is your primary that's, instrument. That's the primary one I'm playing now. I hear you playing piano all the time. So how long have you been playing piano? And I guess the, the main thing is like, where did you start? How did you get started with it? I took, I just took lessons when I was a kid. Oh, okay. Eventually I quit those lessons before I could get very, like, I didn't learn to read music very well. I didn't learn any sort of music theory stuff, and I didn't get super far before I decided that I needed more time to play Pokemon, <laughs> which is solid decision. I really can't fault you for all. this at all. And so then, a while years later, I kind of picked it up again and started teaching myself a bunch of stuff. 
but then I sort of hit a like a plateau. I got kind of stuck repeating basically stuff within my own skill level. Mm -hmm. Didn't really know how to push forward. Every time I tried to read music, I'd get frustrated. I didn't like music theory because like I don't need a bunch of books to tell me how to make music, man. Yeah, and I then like that too. you know, and recently. I've decided to, you know, since my finger still works after the after breaking it, I'm like, hey, wait, I can still play piano. I'm going to invest back into it. I'm going to get serious. So I'm taking lessons again now, reading a book on music theory, and I'm practicing more seriously and learning to read music. So most of cool. my ability to read and understand anything about music theory or the staff or anything is from the last several months. So this is all recent. Yeah. When did you plateau? Was that like teenage years or in your 20s or what? In college, in community college, okay, so that probably was still like college. around 20. And then you really didn't have access to a piano for, or I guess no, I had like had a keyboard. keyboard, that's right. But like that doesn't help you learn a lot of technique with piano because mm -hmm. the, it just feels cheap and plasticky, the one that I had. And while I could write things, basically all of my skills were that I have dexterous hands. I okay. can type really fast. I can hit keys really well. Yeah. But the rest of understanding music and reading music, I've really been trying to learn now. Okay. So what are you doing to... I guess let's, let's break this down into two questions for now because I feel like your skill level has really started to increase in the past several months or maybe last year. What are you doing to practice? And uh, what are you doing to actually learn music theory? And, and how do you learn new pieces and new techniques? So for music theory, I'm just reading Music Theory 101. The okay. book that you Which had, have uh, right yeah, you introduced me to it. I've been flipping through that. It's pretty interesting. And since I'm using piano, which the staff is very, it lines up very obviously with. Mm -hmm. So every time they're like, this is a harmonic minor scale. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let me just go over here and hear it so that I understand what's going on yeah. at the same time. So that's helping that make sense because it makes it real. But when I practice... Sometimes it's sort of a, just a free form practice where I'm just repeating stuff and I'm messing around, I'm writing stuff. But this practice all the time is exactly why I stagnated. So when I'm being more intentional, I've now been putting maybe 20 minutes at least every day into one particular piece, the okay. opening song to Over the Garden Wall. And this is because in the past what I'd do is I would learn and read four or five measures of something. And then I would get annoyed that I didn't know how to read the next one. And then I would just say, well, that's good enough. And then I'd be amused and I'd move on to a new song. Yeah. So I'm really trying to push past that right now. It's like the smart kid in fourth grade who's like finally bumped up against math. He doesn't get, he's like, ah, I was fine with multiplication. Who needs division? Yeah. Like if I'm only doing it to mildly amuse myself, I can't get very far. Yeah. So I'm trying to make myself actually do that and it's not like i'm repeating a bunch of scales or something like that okay. i'm actively trying to learn things that i enjoy playing yeah and i think it's a big thing i think like a and i hesitate to make like claims here because i'm not a great musician but i am somebody who really enjoys playing music every single day and i guess for me I'm not a big fan of going through some pre-prescribed list of learning songs, quote unquote. And I'm not a fan of just like going through scale exercises just for the heck of it. Um, I think a professional music a musician would disagree with me. And they would say like, if you want to get good, you probably need to go through scales. You probably need to do different interval patterns. Like you probably need to do the first, third, second, fourth, that kind of thing. And practice up and down, you know, eight hours a day. In fact, um, somebody who's much more qualified to talk about music than we are is a YouTuber named Adam Neely. And I would recommend anybody who wants to become a better musician to go and subscribe to that guy's channel. He is fantastically knowledgeable and also very good at many instruments. Um, and he has a video on his channel that is a just a five hour, solid five hour stream of him doing scale exercises. And he says at the beginning, it's like, this is basically what a professional musician does on a weekly basis. Like I will sit down here with my bass guitar and I will run through umpteen different scales and umpteen different uh, permutations of that scale. So I'll go linearly up it. I will skip intervals. I will do weird zigzag interval patterns, all kinds of stuff like that. And that's how I practice. You know, maybe you should do that. But I think what has helped us remain um, diligent in the habit of practicing is at, 
spending at least a, some of our time working on the music that we want to play. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the reason I quit before, part of the reason. And I took lessons in community college, too. They mm-hmm. also didn't stick because they're, like, forcing you to play When the Saints Go Marching In yeah. or Yankee Doodle or some nonsense that's, like, I don't care about that song. But then when you had um, Dearly Beloved, that Kingdom Hearts song, mm-hmm. I was I was like, well, this looks reasonably simple, and it sounds really good, and it's very nostalgic. Yeah. I want to play that. So now, in order to do it, because I'm over at your place on the piano, I don't have my sheet music. This is the only music in front of me. I guess I'll learn how to read the bass clef so that I can play this song. (laughs) And now I can read the bass clef because I had a reason to. So, like, I could be compelled to practice scales if I was right up against the level of something I couldn't do in a song I wanted to play. Yep. And... Like, with, without any motivation, I I can't care. Yeah, it's like the just-in-time learning concept. Oh, I can't play this scale well enough. Well, now I got to go off. and It's like a mini mission, Yeah. right? You got to go get, like, a new power in a video game to, to open a door that you can't open right now. Cool. Now I have a reason to go get that new power. Yeah. You know? I was playing Hollow Knight last night, and I really did not want to go down to the, into the abyss, but I need the double jump. So, going down to the abyss to get that, which is one of my least favorite areas of the game. Uh, and speaking of Hollow Knight, I actually have the Hollow Knight theme printed out here because it is another piece that's actually quite simple to play. And other than it being in a key that involves three of the black keys on the piano or three flats, if if you wanted to learn the right hand part, like I think you could become you could be a total day one beginner on piano and learn the first few measures of that on the piano. And I think it would sound great, you know? Now, yeah, maybe it's... you're not going to be playing the left-hand part and the right-hand part at the same time, but this is an example of a piece of music that, at least for me, it's like something that I really want to play, and within five minutes, I was like, oh, this is actually quite simple. But it's not chopsticks or hot cross buns or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, it's, like, it's suitably simple, but it's also, you get joy from it. Mm-hmm. And even if it's just a small amount, and even if you can't play the whole thing, and you're just like, but that part sounds like it did. Yeah. In the other thing that I like, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, playing a little Mario song or a Zelda song or something. There are plenty of like simple melodies you could learn to play on most instruments that would potentially be more motivating at first. And Mm -hmm. then, yeah, I I don't want to read sheet music of stuff that doesn't sound fun when I'm succeeding. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Let's talk a little bit about music theory. So... I guess in your words, what exactly is music theory and at what point does it make sense to start dabbling in it? Well, it's um, basically how popular music, at least in this book, they're specifically referring to Western music, but not all music is formed the same way. Mm -hmm. But basically music is formed in patterns most of the time. The way we write music is very formulaic in a way. We yeah. it, not not in like a this is garbage machine made pop sort of way, but in a we have keys and chords and melodies and mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff like that that is pretty much universal across the most of the music we're going to know. Yeah, and music theory helps explain why it is that mm-hmm. and how they work and I don't finding out how stuff works has been really helpful for me. The actually the other day was the first time in my entire life I had ever written a little little tiny melody where I was on purpose working within a scale. Really? I okay. had never done that before. Yeah. I had never said, I'm going to write in this key. But I really like how uh, harmonic minors sound after I learned about them in that book. So I was like, I'm going to write something in a harmonic minor scale. And then yeah. I did. And that was really cool. And something that not knowing music theory did not help me unlock. Mm-hmm. You know, so suddenly, like... Maybe at first, when I when I was younger, I was like, this is cutting off my creativity. They're trying to tell me how my music should work. But it's more like this is how music does generally work. And now if yeah. you know how, you can do more yourself creatively. Mm-hmm. The way I think about it is learning music theory um, and maybe specifically learning what the keys are and then learning like what the notes are in a specific key. It's like going into a grocery store and trying to figure out what to cook for dinner with literally all the ingredients in the store available to you 
versus being given like seven or eight ingredients and being told, all right, make something. Yeah, like, you, you, know, you know, if I want to make a stir fry, I'm probably going to put in some sort of a starch kind of thing, like some yeah. rice or something. And I'm probably going to put in a protein and some mm-hmm. vegetables. You know what you're going for. Yeah, if I tell you, like, okay, you have you have ground pork and um, bell pepper to work with. It's like, you must use those two ingredients. Okay, you have a starting point, And now you can probably select some other ingredients that you think are going to go well with it. And you can actually get moving. Whereas if I'm just like, make something cool. Here's the entire grocery store. It's very unfocused. Yeah, limitation breeds creativity. Yeah. I, so if you're looking at the entire 88 keys in the piano and you're like, what do I do with this? I don't know. You know, it's very tough to come up with something that sounds good. But if you're like, oh, you can only write something in the key of, say, C minor, which is what Dearly Beloved from Kingdom Hearts is in, what Hollow Knight theme is in, you know, all right, I only get to use these keys. And if people want to go on my Instagram and look at some of the old piano videos that I put up a few weeks ago, those are just me making stuff up in C minor. Just, I just know, all right, I can use these seven keys per octave. That's it. Um, and then like learning chords is a very similar thing. Oh, okay. So it's like start on the first and then skip one interval, like skip the second, go to the third, skip the fourth, go to the fifth. That's a chord. Oh, cool. And then I just need to move each of my fingers up one note. That's the next chord. Okay. So I can just kind of oscillate between these two chords and then make something make something up completely off the top of my head on top of that, that actually sounds pretty good. Um, I have a song on Spotify. It's called Affront to All That Is Good and Holy, number two, because I'm not trying to take myself seriously with my guitar playing. But that song is me switching back and forth between two chords on the guitar. And I recorded that into uh, Ableton Live, which is just a digital audio workstation. Um, I use Logic now, but I was using Ableton at the time. And then I just played that into my headphones, hit record again on a second track, and just completely made stuff up in that same key for a couple minutes. And that was the song. So I think that's a great way to learn. Just, you don't have to, you don't even have to read this whole book. I mean, Music Theory 101 by Brian Boone is, what? 250 pages. So about, I don't know, one-tenth the size of like a real college music theory textbook. You don't have to read this whole thing. I mean, I'm only halfway through this and just learning about intervals, just learning about like how to tell what key you're in, learning about the circle of fifths, that can give you a lot of direction for learning. Yeah. Um, And then also learning songs. I think this is a major area where you and I differ though. It seems like you gravitate more towards learning songs than making stuff up. Whereas my natural inclination is just to make things up and I have a very tough time actually sitting down and disciplining myself to learn songs. Well, I, I used to write a ton of stuff. That's how all of my old music worked. And I, I mean, I had several albums. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And I'm not saying like just you don't make it music, but it I was, like I was stagnating with that yeah. because I would, I would write stuff, but all my writing would only be able to stick within my current level of skill and I didn't yes. know how to write better than that because I didn't I didn't even understand how some things that I've recently learned about mm-hmm. worked. Yeah, so yeah. I couldn't have done them. I didn't know how to and you know, I was playing on a an electric electronic keyboard kind of thing. So it's not like it could even be that dynamic with how I was playing. So my skill was a little limited by that too. Yeah, it was hard but to be expressive. I've been more focused this year on trying to improve my skill level, not just my writing. I have been writing a few things, Mm -hmm. but I've just been kind of toying around with that. Okay. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Brilliant, who have built an amazing learning platform for anyone who wants to improve their skills in the areas of math, science, and computer science. And my favorite thing about Brilliant is that they keep the principle of active learning in mind in everything they do. So whether you're going through their in-depth courses or their daily challenges that they post every single day, you're going to be immediately applying your skills and sinking your teeth into challenging but bite-sized problems that keep your interest high and also make the learning process a lot more efficient. Now, in their library of in-depth courses, you're going to find a ton of different stuff to sink your teeth into, from calculus and statistics and logic, to science courses like gravitational physics and classical mechanics, to computer science courses like computer memory and the fundamentals of computer algorithms, all kinds of great stuff. In addition, every single day they post new daily challenges that you can sink your teeth into across a broad array of areas and topics. So if you want to make learning new things a daily habit, you want to be building that problem-solving muscle every single day, then that is a great feature, and they are 
posting new problems every single day. Now with their free plan, you get access to new daily challenges every single day. You get to access Brilliant across all of your mobile devices and their website on your desktop computer. And you can also check out the introductory modules of all their courses, plus check out their very detailed wiki and their community areas. And if you do decide to subscribe to their premium subscription, you get access to all of their in-depth courses as well as the entire archive of all the daily challenges they've posted since the beginning. So if you want to start learning for free, then go over to brilliant.org slash college info geek. And if you want to get 20% off your annual premium subscription, then be one of the first 83 people to use that link and sign up. Huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode and being a big supporter of our show. And another thanks goes out to our second sponsor this week, Audible. Audible is the best place on the internet to get your hands on audiobooks and other audio programs. They have an unmatched library of audiobooks across tons of different genres. They have all the best sellers. They have tons of obscure stuff. They have science fiction, biographies, psychology books. Basically, if you can think of it, it probably exists on Audible. I use Audible all the time, whenever I'm biking on the bike trails, whenever I'm cooking, whenever I'm doing any kind of mundane task where I really don't have to use my, my higher cerebral functions, I'm using that time to usually learn something new on Audible. And if you want to get a free 30-day trial of Audible along with a free audiobook download, you can go over to audible.com slash CIG or text CIG to 500-500 on your phone. Now, whenever we do Audible spots, we love to recommend books, and I have a very a fitting recommendation this week. There is a book on Audible called How to Listen to and Understand Great Music, third edition from The Great Courses. This is a 36 hour master course on how to appreciate great music. And if you want to become a musician yourself, you want to get better at it, like we talk about in this episode, a lot of times it's good to break down existing songs and see what each individual element is doing. And if you want to learn how to properly appreciate and listen to and break down music, then this is a great. Uh, audiobook to start listening to. Uh, in addition to that recommendation, I know you have one as well. So what is yours this week? Mine this week is going to be Atomic Habits by James Clear, Ooh, because if you want to become a good musician, you're going to need to build the good habit of practicing. And this, this book I thought was a really good overview on how to build new habits, mm -hmm. even when you're busy. And that's the kind of thing that will change your life given enough time. That book, I mean, there are very few books that even if they're useful, have truly life-changing sections. But the idea of starting from your identity instead of starting from a specific goal, I found that to be life-changing. Yeah. I mean, even with uh, with sports, you know, just thinking of myself as an athlete or as a musician instead of just somebody who wants to do a specific thing, that was really, really motivating and made me much better at sticking with my habits. So if you want to download How to Listen to and Understand Great Music or Atomic Habits by James Clear for free, once again, you can go over to audible.com slash CIG and that is A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash CIG or text CIG to 500 500 on your phone. And again, once you start that trial, you can download any audiobook you want. It doesn't have to be our recommendations, though I think Atomic Habits specifically is one that I want everybody to either read or listen to. So that would be a really, really good one to start with if you're not sure where uh, to start. And once you have your membership, every single month you get a credit for one audiobook across their entire library to choose from, along with two Audible originals that you cannot get anywhere else every single month and audio workout programs. As always, big thanks to Audible for sponsoring this podcast and being a big supporter of our show. And one final thanks has to go out to our third sponsor this week, which is FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a great solution for anybody who is a freelancer, anybody who runs their own business and wants to make their accounting and invoicing process a lot more efficient. And if you do any kind of freelance work, if you do freelance web design or graphic design, like say your girlfriend does, she does all of the thumbnails for this podcast and she has to invoice me every single month. If you do any kind of work like that, then you know that in addition to the real work you do in your business, you also have to do the business admin work. You have to do legal stuff. You have to do accounting. You have to send invoices to clients. And this can take a lot of time, which is time that you probably want to spend doing that graphic design or building those websites. And that is exactly where FreshBooks comes in. With FreshBooks, you can send professional, beautifully designed invoices that are generated in less than 30 seconds to your clients, and they can actually pay you via those invoices. So instead of waiting for a check in the mail or trying to get them to pay you via PayPal, they can just pay with a credit card right on the invoice. It's way more convenient for them and you get paid a lot faster. In addition, they also have tools that can make your accounting a lot more efficient or even automated in some cases. They can pull in transactions from your bank statements. They can make it a lot easier to actually categorize those transactions. So again, you get that done a lot faster and you can spend more time making money and doing the kind of work that you actually want to do. 
So if you want to get started, you can go over to freshbooks.com slash CIG to activate a 30 day free trial of their service, completely unlimited use for those 30 days. And when you do that, don't forget to put college info geek in the, how did you hear about us section as well. Big thanks once again to FreshBooks for sponsoring this episode and supporting our show. And let's get back into it. One question that I had in my mind is for people who want to get into piano specifically, you know, where should they start in terms of an investment for like buying a piano? Do you think it's fine to just go to Walmart and buy the $40 Casio digital keyboard? I think that that depends on what you want. Okay. Because unfortunately, that keyboard, if you want to play on a real piano at some point, that keyboard will limit you very greatly in mm. like 80% of how music is played on a piano. The only thing it has in common with it is the keys. But the weight of the keys is different on a real piano. The, the, the action you get from them, the ability to go from soft to like quiet to loud on each key, the pedals, the, the various chords, the resonating frequencies that'll tons of stuff that you can't do yeah. on that. And, and real pianos are expensive generally. They don't have to be though. I've actually seen sites where people are giving away acoustic pianos. Oh, true. Yeah. Because they're moving. Yep. And they're like, I don't know what to do with this. And in fact, my family gave away a piano when we moved to uh, a friend of mine. Okay. So you can find good acoustic pianos for a decent price. They may need to be tuned, which generally you need a professional to do. Mm. And they may be a little old or something, but that's something. I used to play on an upright. And um, sometimes you can get, maybe if you go to a church, sometimes you might be able to play the piano they likely have. My church in high school would let me and my brother and our friend Mark come every single day after school, and they gave us free reign of the entire stage. I don't know what they were thinking, but they gave us free unsupervised reign of the drum set, the multi-thousand dollar Korg digital piano, the upright uh, real piano, all the guitars, and the PA system. That's a lot. I think it's because I knew the tech guy and he trusted me. Like, we never broke anything, so it was fine, but... Yeah, they just they gave us completely unfettered access to a full studio worth of instruments. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Um, there are also so there were music rooms it. in my college, in my yeah, community and college, and at university. And recently, for the last year or so, I was actually renting my piano, mm -hmm. and it was like fifty bucks a month. And your piano is what about a. Fifteen hundred dollar piano if you buy it outright. It's um, I think it's like eighteen, somewhere around two thousand. Okay, I think. But I was just like renting it for a little bit. Yeah, and it's it's a bit of an expensive thing to get into. I did start out on the cheaper keyboards for the mm -hmm. most part. Like when, especially when I came back to music in college, all I had at home was the little electronic, yeah, keyboard thing which does not play very great, but it did let me write melodies and understand scale. Like I could play chords, I could write music. So you're, you're probably not gonna be able to play super expressively on not, something that not costs Not very expressively, very little. no. Though I bet you, and we could probably look and do a little bit of research for the show notes, I bet you there's something in like the four to $500 range that has like somewhat weighted keys, not gonna be great, but like better than nothing. Maybe. You know. Yeah, I'm especially not... in the used range. Like, go on Craigslist, find somebody who's selling like a used digital piano. Yeah, or I think like the that. easiest way would be able to would be to find something that somebody's either selling or giving away. Mm -hmm. But if you like go to get a brand new kind of piano thing, it's going to probably be expensive. Yeah, but that's difficult to give an actual prescription for because in instrument world, it's not like I can just give you an Amazon link. To yeah. the greatest, cheapest acoustic... They're not going to mail you an acoustic piano to, <laughs> to the Amazon lockers. And then... <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, so I would say, like, you know, if, if people are on a budget, look for practice rooms on campus if you're in college or in high school. They often have pianos. Um, in Denver, there's actually music, like, rehearsal space, and you can rent very, very small rooms that have a piano in them. Oh, nice. Um, I think that the cheapest one I've seen is like eight bucks an hour for a room with a piano in it. Very small vocal room. Very likely we'll have a death metal band practicing in the next room over. So it's, you know, maybe not going to be the best thing in the world, but that would be an option for, you know, very little investment. Also, 
um, 16th Street Mall literally has pianos yeah, just, just sitting out in, in the open. You know, maybe people aren't going to enjoy what you're playing if you're a beginner, but that technically is available to you. Yeah. So uh, that's useful. And then you're starting lessons again now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I've been taking lessons again because I I want um, – having an expert around to tell you what you're doing wrong is mm. very much easier than just me playing the same thing over and over, not realizing I'm forming a bad habit yeah. until I've formed it, and then it's incredibly hard to break it later when somebody's like, you aren't supposed to be doing it like that. Yeah. That's why your wrist hurts all the time. Oh, no. But that's mm-hmm. the only way I remember how to do it now. I have to start over everything. Like having somebody there to point you in the right direction and to correct you as you learn will keep you from compounding mistakes that yeah. will be very annoying to get rid of later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I learned the same thing with figure skating. Got my coach and she immediately pointed out probably 10 different things that I could not have noticed. Even if I had videotaped myself, I wouldn't have noticed myself doing these things because I didn't know what to look for. Yeah. Like having my... My free leg way too far out when doing a three turn. Wouldn't have noticed it. I was just constantly off balance and couldn't hold my, my circles or my uh, my edges afterwards. And then she just pointed it out. Hey, bring your knee in. Keep the foot a little closer and you'll be fine. Instant improvement. So I would like to get a piano teacher at some point as well. Um, I've never had a guitar teacher. I think my Me mom either. bought us like the community continue learning classes. Uh, She bought us a guitar lesson through that one time through a community college. So it was my brother and I, like her sitting there just to watch us and then a bunch of adults. And I think that was a four week class. So we took that when I was probably 11 years old. My brother was nine. Neither of us really learned anything from it because we were kids and didn't want to pay attention to a lesson at 6 p.m. at night. Other than that, I've never taken a lesson. And uh, I have really weird history with learning the guitar because I never learned any real songs other than maybe the the first intro lick to Welcome Home by Coheed and Cambria other like and then Smoke on the Water maybe you know just your your typical first beginner song but most guitarists I know if they're good they can sit there and play Metallica or they can sit there and play a lot of famous licks or like full songs from artists I can't do that. But what I can do is improv pretty well. So I guess I want to kind of just describe the way that I learned guitar because it kind of makes sense to me. And it gave me a foundation for playing stuff that I that I thought was fun to play really quickly. Um, so this is called the caged method. And basically, if you put the major scale on a guitar fretboard. And I would encourage anybody who's learning the guitar to go and look up major scale on the guitar fretboard. It's gonna show you the actual fingers. Um, And it's gonna shift, like the the specific frets that fingerings are gonna go on will shift based on the key. So if if you're playing in the key where you can play your typical E minor chord. And actually I brought my guitar, so I'm just gonna demonstrate a little bit. Um, Mine's in drop D, so. But like if you are in the key where you can play like this, just like two fingers on that fret, then you're basically playing in, I think, E minor. So what I did was, and this is something that I like kind of figured out on my own. I just remember the first riff that I ever made up was this. Which actually sounds kind of okay. And the cool thing about it is it does not require me to move my hand at all. There's just four frets, so one fret for each of my four fingers. And there's a lot that you can do within those four frets if you can just learn the intervals. So the way that I learned to improv was by figuring out by ear the major scale or the minor scale, however you want to call it, uh, on the fretboard. And then just instead of trying to go on one string and play the entire minor scale, it was literally just within that block of four frets, figuring things out. Hmm. Um, and apparently this is a method and it's called the caged method where there's essentially five different blocks of frets where you can play, um, the major scale, or the minor scale. So what I would do is look up those caged shapes and we can put that in the, in the show notes and then just practice doing stuff in one of the shapes. So, I mean, this one's, I think this is the easiest one. I, I well, I can't really can't really show people. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
All right, look up like E minor scale on the guitar and the one that starts on the second string, which is the A string, seventh fret, that's the easiest group for me, I think. Because it's just first finger, third finger, fourth finger, first finger, third finger, fourth finger, first finger, third finger. I mean, that's all it is. So you can do all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and then once you've kind of practiced a bit in those fret shapes, the next step is to start moving between them. And once you can do that, you can just sort of make stuff up. Hmm. So if you know what key you're in, if you know your fret shapes like that, your caged method fret groupings, and you can figure out the chords that go with that, um, especially if you're playing an E minor, you can literally just do like E minor and then switch between that and another chord. You can make stuff up and sound pretty good right off the bat. Uh, and then if you buy yourself a capo, which is just like this little clamp that will clamp onto one fret and change like the guitar's key, nothing like clamps, uh, then you can play in different keys very easily without having to do crazy chord shapes. Yeah. So that's basically how I learned. And, and what, what are your like long-term goals? Like what makes you want to do music? What do you intend to do with it? I want to do everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is, I mean, th this is my problem, isn't it? I'm horrible at focusing my goals. Look at the impossible list. It's that's the, the online diary of somebody with goal. What's the word for it? ADHD possibly. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the first goal I have is to put out an album of study music, you know, and this is a little bit cynical because like, I realized that we already kind of have this, this studying academic focused business with an audience. And I already have a study playlist. Clearly the place for me to move into with my music is study music because there is some transfer there. I think if I come up with an album of like black metal, there's not going to be a whole lot of crossover yeah. with audience interest there. Um, but also I really like doing improvisational acoustic guitar. I love the flamenco style, all that kind of stuff. I mean, even though I listen to a lot of metal, often my favorite tracks off of metal albums are the very calm acoustic interludes. I have a couple of them on the study playlist. So that is my first goal. And I want to make study music that isn't just guitar based, which is why I'm learning piano and why I'm learning music production. So I can throw in like string ensemble VSTs and things like that. Um, I'm also taking vocal lessons because eventually I would like to do music with vocals and my experience there, which has been about six months worth has taught me uh, the same thing that you've learned having a teacher. Very, very useful. Yeah especially with singing because I think with guitar it's easy to look up a tutorial and just kind of like look at what the person's doing and, and mime it because it's very it's very regimented I'm putting a finger on a specific fret and then I'm moving up to another fret and there may be techniques that different people use but it's pretty easy to get started without needing a teacher um, with singing at least in my opinion or my experience I did not know what to do even when I would listen to people like Ken Tamplin on uh, YouTube, who does like a bunch of really good vocal tutorials, I would listen to his exercises and I'd be like, is that what I'm supposed to do? And, you know, I tried them out and I even tried recording them, but I didn't know what to listen for. I literally didn't know if I was doing it right or wrong. So at least with vocals, going and getting a teacher and having someone say, oh, your resonance is bad. You need to move the power more into your diaphragm and less in like the top of your, your throat. Um, you need to work on transitioning from chest voice to head voice, all these things. I literally just didn't know what to listen for, even if I could look up the techniques. Yeah. So having a teacher there, very, very useful. Um, and that might be a, a, a decent place unless there's something else that you want to talk about with your development, how you practice, um, things like that. Make sure, I guess focusing on expression and technique is important to me. Like mm. you don't, you don't want every note to sound like the, exactly the same. Make sure that you're you're feeling the music yeah. when you play it and learning to be more expressive because if I play even the most beautiful song ever written and every note has the same volume, the same speed, and it's just like robotic, it won't sound good anyway. Mm -hmm. um, make sure your technique doesn't hurt you. If you're starting a new instrument and you notice you're you're getting some muscle tension somewhere or you're, you're running out of breath, you're getting dizzy because you you don't have a good breathing technique to do yeah. like a saxophone or something. Or even pay, singing. Pay attention to this kind of stuff mm -hmm. first if you don't have a teacher and then, you know, maybe find somebody who 
even if you don't get in a professional teacher, maybe find somebody who might be able to say, yeah, that's why you're hurting yourself. Don't, yeah. don't master the technique of hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. My and, teachers uh, actually told me, print out the songs you're studying and actually write down where the breaths are. Yeah. And I think you've said to do that with rap too. Yeah, I, I, I've to never like an M &M verse or written something it like down, but I, I've definitely considered where in any verses I'm writing do I breathe? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I've had to rewrite sections because I was like, oh, wait a second. There's no there's nowhere to breathe. There's no air in there. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. But, and I guess just like, obviously, like language, this is going to take a lot of practice, like everything. Like the people who become masters at this practice hours every day for yeah. like a decade or more did you simply can't practice five minutes a day and then hope to be a virtuoso. You can still hope to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You can still have fun and write things, but if you got to be clear on what your goals are and then what commitment that actually requires, because otherwise you'll just be disappointed in the end. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of where I am. You know, I realize that I've got a lot going on and I'm not going to be virtuoso, which is yeah, totally not fine with me. I'm not a professional musician. I don't have time to put in five hours of scales mm -hmm. today. I got other stuff to do. I, I'm mainly having fun. I'm having fun, but I want to put something out into the world. So I know I need to learn several different things to make that happen or potentially pay a mixing and mastering engineer to help me out with it. But I'm not looking to do the most complex guitar solos ever made. I'm not looking to become like a, a you know, accomplished concert piano player. Yeah. But I want to have fun and I want to keep getting better. Yeah, and you can write music without getting, without being a virtuoso. You can write mm -hmm. good music. Like all the stuff that I wrote, I'm happy with it. And a lot of stuff that I listen to is just not that difficult to play. You know, like a lot yeah. of bands will play like, what, three chords and they just repeat them over and over and now you've got a song. I mean, most of pop music is four chord it's, progression. It's very simple. You know, and then they might have a melody built over that. They might have some drum fills, things like that. But in fact, there's a video we can put it in the show notes. Uh, it's a comedic band. I think they're from the UK and they have this whole entire medley where they start playing a four chord progression and they never change the four chord progression, but they change uh, between different famous songs. And there's like 15 different super famous <laughs> songs. They literally never change the progression. And it's just, it's crazy. Like you don't think about it, but a lot of pop music that's really famous is the same simple chord progression. Yeah. So you don't have to be crazy. Um, this is something that I'm starting to get into because I want to learn how to actually write songs and produce music, I'll listen to a song more critically and I'll try to break down, all right, what is the bass line doing? What is the chord progression doing? How do these things work together? Most music sounds pretty complicated, but if you listen for each element, a lot of times it's not actually that complex. Unless you're listening to Dragon Force or Opeth or something crazy. But you know, if you're listening to your average Taylor Swift song, there's a lot going on there in terms of production, but the actual songwriting is not that compl uh, complicated at all. Yeah. So that could be a good thing to do. You know, if you actually want to play songs, start breaking them down, listening to individual elements. Um, there are some pretty cool YouTube channels that do song breakdowns. There was one that I found the other day, and I can't remember the name, but I know I subscribed to them. So we could um, link to them in the show notes. They had this really interesting breakdown of the bass line in a really recent Run the Jewels song that was on the uh, the Venom soundtrack. Hmm. And it was a video on how to write a more interesting bass line. And they were kind of breaking down how Run the Jewels had taken a 4-4 beat, but um, instead of just doing like on each of the four beats, they had gone down to eighth notes and created this really interesting bass line. It's like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two instead. And it makes it sound pretty cool. The song is uh, Let's Go by Run the Jewels, if anyone's curious. It's a pretty cool song actually. So, yeah, just start dabbling, I think. I mean, you could go into a really, really structured practice regimen if you want, and maybe that will, like, if you can discipline yourself to do it, maybe that will get you a further ahead faster than what we're saying here. But I don't know. I think, like, the combination of finding songs that you like to play, um, dabbling enough in music theory and dabbling enough in the actual structure of how music is created to know what to do like to kind of limit your options to be more creative if you can do that and combine those two things then you're going to progress and you're going to enjoy doing it yeah it's just yeah. a balance between efficiency and enjoyment mm -hmm. and, and if you can afford it get teachers you know or do group lessons 
even if you do group lessons, that's a great way to, to actually get feedback from an, from an experienced person without having to pay $65 an hour for a private lesson. I'd never even considered a group lesson. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what Anna just did for snowboarding lessons. Hmm. Like private snowboarding lessons cost a lot of money, but the group ones cost, you know, a significant amount less. And a lot of times you don't need the teacher's full attention the entire time. You need them to say, here is how to do the technique correctly. You need some time to practice it. And then you need a little bit of their time to give you feedback after you've had a few go arounds doing it yourself. You know, and then you go off and practice yourself and you come back. You just need little time, little bits of time for feedback and little bits of time for instruction. Yeah. Obviously a private lesson will be better, but that costs more money. So there will probably be a lot of stuff in the show notes for this episode. Um, so you're probably going to want to go over to CIGpodcast.com slash 256. And there we'll have uh, a link to the music theory book that we're both using. It's a very simple music theory book. I think that's actually a good thing because it means it's not too intimidating. Yeah, it's not overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, it's you could read a chapter and know something new and it would be fine. It's not like a gigantic college textbook. Um, I would also recommend if you want to learn to read music or you want to go find the sheet music for cool songs, there's a site called musescore.com. And I think you use that. Yeah. I use it too. And uh, I think you have to subscribe to print out PDF sheet I've been music. able to download stuff. I oh, just, really? I have, a, I have an account. That's all. And you're not paying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's nice. Just being logged in lets me download them. Well, okay then. Maybe you don't have to pay. Um, I know there's an iPad app. Oh, maybe maybe it's the app that you have to pay for. Oh, I just I print out my sheet music. I literally okay. have a binder with plastic sheets. Yeah, and I've started doing that too because their iPad app has some some quirks that uh, leave a few things to be desired. But the cool thing about MuseScore is it has a MIDI generator that will play the sheet music. It's not going to sound good, but it will at least kind of be like a sanity check. Uh, it's been pretty useful. For example, I printed out this Hollow Knight theme, and I spent a bunch of time last week teaching myself the notes in the bass clef, which I had never known before. Um, and my mnemonic for remembering the, the not the lines, but the gaps between for the bass clef is uh, all cats eat garbage. <laughs> hmm. I think you had one as well, but I can't remember what it was. But, and it, you know, because it's face for the treble clef. Yeah. It took me longer than I care to admit to realize that the staff for the Hall Night main theme is a treble clef and another treble clef beneath it. I didn't even notice it. I just assumed it was another bass clef. So I was sitting there playing the left hand piece with bass clef notes being like, this just doesn't sound right. And then I went and listened to it on the MIDI and we're like, oh wait, this is treble. <laughs> that, that would explain it. <laughs> yeah. There is also another program, I'm not sure if you've used this one, called Synesthesia. I've heard of it. And there's a lot of YouTube videos for synesthesia where it's basically guitar hero for piano. Um, musician is like that too, but synesthesia is free. And I think musician does it where it's, it's literally just the notes. Like you actually, you have to be able to read music and they're coming yeah, it's at trying you to teach you to read the music. Yeah. I found that very difficult though. Maybe it would be good to use that. Um, synesthesia can do that, but it can also just have the note coming down from the top of the screen to the actual key on a virtual keyboard. And if you have a MIDI controller or a digital piano with any kind of MIDI input, you can plug your piano into your computer and you can actually play it and it'll give you scores and things like that. So personally, I'm not doing that. I don't think you are either. No, nope. just printing out sheet music and sitting there puzzling it out, learning it. But that's another option. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure that I learn to read music this time. Me too. Which means that if I give myself a, yeah, a way to like skip around it, I will probably skip around it in the name of amusing myself, mm -hmm. and that's that's gonna hurt myself again. One thing I've also been doing is playing the notes and saying the name of the note out loud while playing it, because one issue that I've been running into is. I'll play a section of a song. Let's say it's Dearly Beloved. If I do it two or three times, I've memorized it. So at that point, like I can look at the sheet music and try to follow it, but my my hands know where to go. Yeah. So I don't think I'm getting any more practice in reading music with that. And maybe there's, maybe people in the comments on the YouTube version of this podcast can give some suggestions for how to go past that. I feel like maybe the best way to do it is just to have many pieces of music printed out and cycling through them. 
so maybe it's a little harder to memorize the sections. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've leaned on memory a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so I would like to figure out, you know, what's the best way to actually force myself to learn to read music. And maybe it's just to have a lot of music sitting around so I can't lean on memorization. I don't know. This is definitely an episode where we are not experts. We're just kind of sharing some of the things we've been doing, what's helped us progress. Yeah, I'll be I'll be an expert next year. Yeah. I already I, I stagnated for like 10 years. Give me like a year. <laughs> Give me one year. Give me a year. I won't be an expert next year, but I can tell you one thing. I will be much better next year. You know? I'm I'm, going to be virtuoso next year. Oh, that's cool. My new piano is getting here on Tuesday. I would not be surprised if next year you're to a level where at least to my ears, it's virtuoso. Well, that's the thing. You don't really need to be a virtuoso. You just need to be able to trick people who don't know the difference into thinking you're virtuoso. I mean, what was that little piece you were playing earlier today? That was just me repeating the same chord, broken three times isn't that an actual piece though it is from a piece um do you know what it's called but yeah it is just i mean when you um, broke it down it seemed similar pretty simple just very fast but before you broke it down it seemed unfathomable to me i don't know what it's called Mm. right now your teacher just tells you to play it i have it play that thing i don't know who wrote it i don't know what it's from okay it's I don't even have my sheet music on me. Maybe you could throw in the show notes or I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll be able to find it because like, I think it's like Phantom Rider or something like that. But that's a really common set of words. Like I can't immediately find what I'm actually looking for. So I don't know that that's right or I don't know who it's by or something. I can link to it if I find the actual same thing. Cool. Um, I know I had one more thing that I wanted to say. Oh, yes. So the other thing, I guess, and this is kind of a guitar specific thing for me, but I'm sure that it would apply to other things. Um, I think that you should try to identify songs that use a certain technique or maybe just a lick of a song that uses a technique and then use that to make yourself progress. And this is a big thing that my vocal teacher has been doing. He's been giving me songs that have a lot of one specific technique exhibited in them. So he gave me an Alan Stone song that's super falsetto heavy, so I have to work on my head voice. Mm-hmm. Or he gave me a, a periphery song that just came out called Garden in the Bones. And he's like, yeah, practice this one section uh, at about uh, three and a half minutes into the song just to work on your endurance and your ability to do high notes because it's incredibly difficult. And I think one of the biggest things I've learned since starting vocal lessons is it's a good idea to pick songs that are a little bit too difficult for you to do because eventually that just pushes you in a way that playing songs that are easy doesn't. And you'll know when you're making progress. Yeah, exactly. Um, And to wrap this up, practice a lot. Yeah, a whole lot. Lots of practice. All of them. Make it a habit. Put it in your habit tracker. Put it in your habitica. Get the 20-second rule going. Yes. I started trying to practice 40 minutes a day a couple weeks ago. Turned out that I kind of just already do. Like I'd get a stopwatch going on my phone and I'd start it every time I went over because I'd just go over and play it all the time. It already happens by mm-hmm. accident. Just because it's there, it's on my way to everything. So I stop and I play in between every activity. I put lunch in the microwave for one minute and 30 seconds. And I said, I'm going to go practice guitar for one minute and 30 seconds while I wait for my food. And then I left the food in the microwave for 45 minutes <laughs> while writing a lick until you got here. Yeah, it sounds exactly <laughs> like you. But yeah, basically, uh, you know, you can work in practice without making it feel like a terrible chore. Yeah. Unless you want to be a virtuoso, in which case I'm I'm going to just need you to torture yourself, basically. Find a way to enjoy yeah. it, but you will have to practice far more than, yeah. like, will still be fun that day. I think that's kind of what Adam Mealy was getting at in that five-hour practice session. If you want to be a professional musician, yeah, you need to you, you need to keep going probably. when it's not fun today anymore. When you're yeah. like, I want to quit today. You're not done yet. You know, and everybody if you want else to get good. Whatever. You probably need to go past the point at where it's fun. But I guess all I'm trying to say is, I think there are ways to make your practice more fun while still being productive. It's still going to be hard. There's still going to be dips, but I would much rather practice songs I like. I would much rather improv, given you know a specific key, than sit there practicing hot cross buns. Yeah. You know, or going through some really boring progression from the eighties just because some teacher told me to. So I think that's gonna about wrap it up. Um once again, CIGpodcast.com slash two fifty six. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, we'll have all kinds of good stuff in there. 
And uh, I'll also link to my Instagram where I've got some additional samples and things like that. And uh, maybe my, my song on Spotify too. If you want to go follow me on Spotify, you can do that if you want. Otherwise, uh, once again, collegeinfogeek.com slash merch if you want to get yourself a mug or a shirt. And uh, if you have not subscribed to this podcast, you can do so on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Google Play, all the places where there are podcast apps, you can find us. So if you want to get the new episodes downloaded to your device of choice every Monday morning when they come out, instead of just watching them on YouTube or in the browser, you can do that. If you really want to help support this show, then giving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or sharing this podcast with a friend is a great thing to do and we highly appreciate it. All right, I think that is about going to do it. So as always, thank you so much for hanging out with us and we will see you in next week's episode. Stay cute.